Hello, it's Mrs. Blanchard, and this is our first in our uh, at-home lecture series uh, created by me for you. Oops, there we go. Okay, so this is chapter 20. We did chapter 20, we skipped to chapter 21 to do the progressives, uh, but now we're back on chapter 20 to start with foreign policy um, and how the 1890s and imperialism really sets the tone for the rest of the 20th century to come. So today I'm going to give you, or tonight rather, uh, I'm going to give you a little brief overview of what imperialism is, and then I'm, I'm going to have to make a separate video on the Spanish-American War. So let's start. Uh, so this is mainly coming from Section 5 of your textbook. Uh, I'd also really highly suggest the uh, John Green Crash Course for this. Uh, it gives a really a lot of good analysis and, and a good overview uh, that... Uh, if I gave to you, it would be 30 minutes, so I'm going to give you 15 minutes, and there's another 15 minutes if you want to hear more about the topic. So, the cost of expansion. We've talked about Frederick Jackson Turner. We really started off the entire year with him um, and noted that in 1890, when the federal census closed the, um, the frontier in America, Turner talked about how it had shaped America into a more adventurous people, that evolutionary model, that America's success is tied to expansion. Um, you know, that gives us these ideas of American individualism, American exceptionalism, this rugged American um, identity. But we're also going to kind of use that as in 1890, a lot of crises hit America. The Panic of 1893, mass immigration of these new immigrants, um, and the closing of the American frontier. We start turning our attention outward, uh, and that's going to be the imperialism, or new imperialism as it's known in American history, the new imperialism that begins in the 1890s as well. So before we really talk about imperialism itself, I want to take a moment to address some of the critics. Most of these critics kind of emerge um, at the onset of the uh, Filipino War, which is actually at the tail end of the Spanish-American War. So it's a little bit of anachronistic to talk about it first, but I'm going to. Um, these critics are form what's known as the Anti-Imperialist League. Some of the Anti-Imperialists include people you know as Jane Addams, Andrew Carnegie, and Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain. Um, they cite democratic reasons as well as racist reasons for anti-imperialism. That America, just like Turner had said, had developed its own unique identity based on democracy and the expansion of the frontier, and that other countries should be entitled to the same experience, uh, as well as not wanting to bring in uh, different races to the United States and to the American sphere. However, most Americans are really going to support this new imperialism of the late uh, 18th and 19th century. So a lot of the reasons they support it are going to be for very racist reasons. Many Americans propose that the economic crisis, the panic, the end of the Long Depression required new markets for American products. And this is also an offshoot of the Second Industrial Revolution, uh, where we need markets for these new products. Others suggested America needed new frontiers to spread their democracy to, and that's this extension of manifest destiny, this God-given right of the American people to expand. The Chicago World's Fair had also brought, uh, highlighted these new places um, ripe for kind of colonization, showed how American products might be marketed throughout the world, and kind of reinforced this contrast between the Anglo-Saxons, who Americans are kind of coming to see as being entitled or fit to rule, and in this kind of social Darwinist way, these savage people that need to be shown the right way to uh, kind of develop and become civilized. And a lot of this is also racist-based arguments similar to the Jim Crow laws that take place or even those pro-slavery arguments we had kind of looked at last year before the American Civil War. A growing number of writers urge Americans to take up what's known as the white man's burden, coined by Rudyard Kipling, who you might know from writing such things as The Jungle Book. Um, the white man's burden um, is that white people, kind of this racist argument again, need to... Um, help civilize other people, that it's our burden or duty to help civilize other races and nationalities. Two terms I really want you to go away with a functional understanding of after today um, are, are xenophobia and jingoism. 
xenophobia being this fear of foreigners, and that's a lot of what the anti-imperialists, um, their arguments was driven by xenophobia, the fear of bringing in new people into the United States. And jingoism is more this white man's burden, that your history, that your culture, that your government is better or far superior than any other out there. Think Fox News. Our last argument is going to be by people like Josiah Strong, who make an evangelical argument that we need to help Christianize the rest of the world. And so missionary work is going to proliferate during this time period. So this missionary zeal is going to be a really big cause of um, imperialism, especially in places such as China. Um, after the Civil War, missionary activity is increasing. College campuses um, start uh, recruiting for these missionary experiences and people going uh, to Africa um, and Asia especially. The YMCA and YWCA are created during this time period, the Young Men's Christian and the Young Women's Christian Association, to create a worldwide crusade to reach and civilize non-Christians. And they help generate public interest in foreign lands and lay the groundwork for a lot of the economic expansion that's to come, especially after the Panic of 1830, um, 1893, when we're looking for new markets and new access to raw materials. And China is going to receive a lot of this um, effort and energy. Um, so beginning in the 1860s, America had already begun uh, expanding. We had really, you know, after the treaties of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase, really fulfilled most of our uh, North American uh, manifest destiny. Uh, so after the Civil War, Secretary of State William Henry Seward um, annexes Alaska. Uh, your book calls it Seward's Icebox, most commonly called Seward's Folly, because most people did not think that this was a wise decision, uh, you, that you're really buying a hunk of ice. Little do they know, if you fast forward 30 years, that Klondike Gold Rush of 1897 is what's going to be um, pulling us out of the Long Depression uh, and the devastation of the Panic of 1893. However, I'm going to agree with John Green on this and say, Acknowledge the existence of Canada's tail. The U.S. policy is going to emphasize a lot of economic control, and going along with that will be their purchase of uh, the Great White Fleet, the building up of 16 naval ships, all painted gleaming white, uh, that we see as an important part of maintaining an overseas empire. We're trying to strengthen our navy and play an increasing role throughout the Western Hemisphere, and it all kind of stems back to this man, Albert Mahan, that you can read more about in your textbook, and he publishes a book called The Importance of Sea Power in History. The past three years, Years, I've made the kids read long excerpts from it. And I'm sure it helped put them to sleep at night, but you guys are being saved uh, from it this year. Uh, but our fleet, our naval fleet, is going to be really important to America's imperial power. And this is why, kind of fast forwarding to next week when we talk about Roosevelt's foreign policy, his big stick diplomacy, uh, the Panama Canal is going to play such an important role in his presidency. So imperialism. Why are we imperializing? We want to create economic, cultural, and territorial relationships. We're building an empire. Uh, we're looking at the world in a global context. Um, and that we see that this is um, our Easter bonnet. Our best pride is our world power that we'll get through expansion. There are markets for exports, sources for raw material. These boats need to get coal from places and fuel up. Um, companies who are failing or having problems during the Great uh, Long Depression and after the panic need sources for new revenue as well as markets and help divert those urban energy uh, energies, a lot of the tension in the cities created by the new immigrants. Um, and perhaps this is this new frontier in American history. After the American frontier closes in 1890, maybe we're expanding this frontier to new areas. So, one of the first places we're going to focus on today is that of China. And really, Secretary of State John Hay's request in the Open Door Policy. Uh, the Open Door uh, Note by John Hay was sent out to European countries at the end of the Sino-Japanese War. And they really said that um, Russia, France, 
England, all of the big European countries should be able to carve up China into their individual spheres of influence, economic spheres um, that they would have control over. And this open door note was supposed to be like the key to the Chinese markets for American companies as well as all of these other European countries. And the idea is that each sphere will prevent competition and create an open market for everyone. Uh, however, it's followed by this Boxer Rebellion, a group of uh, Chinese nationalists um, uprise with this saying of kill the foreign devils um, to drive out the Americans that they see have um, hurt their country and have carved it up at the expense of the Chinese. In all, there's 200 whites killed and they're mo mainly going to be a lot of missionaries. And it's going to end up driving out the Americans from China for quite a long time and create a lot of anti-capitalist and anti-American animosity, which, of course, we still kind of feel those repercussions today. Um, the last place I really want to talk about right now is Hawaii. The United States annexes Hawaii in 1898. Uh, we had been aiding in um, rebellions there uh, going back at least 20 years. Um, uh, I'm going to flip to the next slide real quick. One reason that aiding these rebellions is so important to Americans is that Senator Dole, um, his cousin, owns Dole Pineapple Company, or the company that will become Dole Pineapple. And we see uh, Hawaii as not just important as a stepping stone into Asia, and one of, again, these places to fuel up, but also the um, pineapple and sugar uh, plantations uh, are powerful economic incentives. Um, I kind of love this cartoon at the right, Uncle Sam, the Army and the Navy, holding up their end. Uh, and then when you read the caption, John Bull, who's like this typical Englishman, saying, it's really most extraordinary what training will do. Why, only the other day I thought the man unable to support himself. And this is kind of a problem for Americans, to reconcile that we too had once been uh, imperialized or colonized, really, uh, and that's why this is this new imperialism. We're not seeking to colonize. We're very careful to always call it uh, imperialization. So Hawaii is annexed in 1898 as a joint resolution by both houses of Congress. And this is this problem, this weakness of the less the Magnificent Seven, specifically McKinley, that he's so beholden to business interest and the Senate and Congress that he really can't stop it from going through. Uh, they extend the Chinese Exclusion Act to apply to Hawaii and Hawaii citizen, Hawaiian citizens and restrict immigration in America. Uh, and then I list, love this cartoon. We'll try to take a look at it in class if we haven't already tomorrow. Um, down at the bottom it says school begins. And just take a moment so we can talk about it in class and you can have a few observations ready. So I know we just took a flying trip around the globe, uh, but we're going to end it there. And our next lecture will be on the Spanish-American War.